founder of Elite Sports Performance. With young players, mistakes are always going to happen. He was world champion at five years old. My wife would agree with you. The one that I've seen in the flesh was Rafa Nadal. He's a monster, isn't he? What would you tell yourself if you can go back in time? Underslept drivers are more dangerous on the road than drunk drivers. Who's the greatest football player? When I was 15, I lost two uncles in the space of three weeks. Hello and welcome again to the Inside Track with me, Luca Allen. I am delighted to welcome Chris Bowman. Chris Bowman is the founder of Elite Sports Performance. Chris, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. How are you feeling? Good. Bright and early. Yep. Yeah. Refreshed. Nice are, coffee. Thanks. Are you are you a morning kind of guy? Uh, I am very much a morning, more of a morning guy. Yeah, to be honest. Did you get your eight hours sleep? Uh, probably about seven. Oh, but, yeah. yeah. We'll talk about sleep in, in, in a bit. I've noticed you have got a mug here. What, what's this mug about? Tell me the story about the mug. Uh, no major story. I mean, as you can probably appreciate, every uh, every man likes their own mug, you know. So uh, the sea is just my mug. Yeah, yeah. I've I've noticed with uh, with guys, typically speaking, especially from the north of England. They tend to be very territorial when it comes to their certain things, right? So yeah. are you the kind of guy that if anyone was to touch that mug, you're going to give them a little bit of a clip around the ear? I don't know, but I mean, if I'm, if I'm making a, a round of coffees, for example, like, no, one, no one's getting that mug, you know? Yeah. What if there's a nice lady that you've been talking to, she wants to have a... a still, short, still not getting it. Still not going to get it. No, fair enough, fair enough. It. So Chris, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? You know, what, what are you doing here in Dubai? Tell us a little bit about your, your company and, um, and also a little bit about what makes you tick. Yeah, sure. So um, moved here in 2018, uh, initially as just an independent practitioner, um, a physio by trade, um, and just aimed to put a service in place really to uh, fill a gap that I felt was in the market with elite sports people coming to Dubai and not really having a kind of trusted practitioner that knew uh, other practitioners within professional football predominantly. Um, so yeah, in the first... Uh, First kind of six weeks, we ended up with 42 professional footballers doing their off-season with wow. us, um, which was, you know, I'd have, I'd have been happy with 10, you know. Yeah. Um, some big names in there as well. Robert Lewandowski was one of our clients oh, at that look point. Look at you name-dropping. Um, oh, nice. And, uh, and it just blew up from there, really. Wow. So it wasn't elite as, as uh, the business now is. It was yeah. more just Chris, and then we've organically grown over the last four and a half years. Um, we're about to open our own sports performance and rehab center in Dubai Hills. Amazing. Um, and yeah, hopefully that will uh, enable us to kind of uh, put in place a 360 degree kind of holistic approach to performance, health, wellness nice. Very um, nice. from, from that. So how did you get into all of this, from, you know, from the beginning? Uh, so I was a, always a passionate sports person, uh, played at Preston's Academy, uh, which is where I'm from, um, as, a, as a kid. Um, was always kind of academic and into my science and my PE and all that sort of stuff. So um, very quickly kind of identified that physiotherapy was something I wanted to go into, probably more so than being a footballer, even though I am a failed footballer. Oh, yeah. So I think we all are at some point. Where, where, where <laughs> can I ask, where did you start off in your, in your professional career? When it comes um, to football? In football? Yeah. In um, football. Or from physio point of view? No, no, from a football from perspective. A football you said you're a failed footballer, so I want to know what happened with that. Well, just I was at Preston's Academy and okay. ultimately wasn't good enough, you okay. know, but um, the Northwest is a hotbed of, yeah. uh, of football in talent and there's plenty of professional players out there that are, are kind of friends of mine from over the years mm -hmm. and um, they have gone on to some great things. Um, Phil Jones being one who's obviously okay. represented England and yeah, Man nice. United. Um and yeah, just always wanted to be involved in the game, but combine it kind of with my, my academia, really. Yeah, very nice. So that didn't stop you? No, um, you know, always been a passionate sports person and I'm one of those kind of weird guys that always puts myself challenges out there. So uh, through February, I just ran 150K in the month. Um, wow. And um, yeah, just, I, yeah. I, I like to stay active. 
So did you always did you always know you were going to get into the sports side of things, the physiotherapy side of things from, from a very young age? Or was this something you kind of stumbled into because you were good at it? To be honest, uh, my mum somewhere has got a piece of paper from the first day of high school, right? Okay, and nice. um, they, uh, you know, it's on there. It's what was your favourite band? What's your favourite yeah, food, yeah, yeah. you know? And what do you want to be when you grow up? You know, the, the magic classic, question that, classic that we question. all get asked. Yeah. Uh, and actually on there, it says, um, you know, so what would that be? 1st of September, 2002. Uh, it says I will be a physiotherapist. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. Okay, look at that. That's Which is an interesting thing because there's a, a chap called uh, Pete Cohen actually, who I uh, presented at the MeFit Fitness Conference with. He's a sports psychologist. And yeah. He kind of reverse engineers this whole future self concept. Yeah. Um, and he he's very much of the opinion like you know you need to know uh, who you want to be and mm. and where you want to go. So when he kind of presented that, I thought. Oh, yeah. hold on a minute. Maybe maybe there is something yeah. in that, you know? You almost manifested it, right? You're putting it down on a piece of paper, you're throwing yeah. it out to the universe saying, hey, I am ready to do this. I'm really excited about doing it. And look, look where you are now. It's yeah. fantastic. Correct, yeah. So, um, look, obviously I work in in, in, um, in the sort of the marketing sphere, advertising, etc. So I've got to ask you a question about a brand, right? So do you have a favorite brand? Is it a sports brand? Is there a story behind that choice? Yeah. I think the two really that stick out to me um, would be probably Apple, um, you know, I find it fascinating how they kind of, you know, in their own words, change the status quo. Mm -hmm. um, you know, big big fan of that kind of message um, and the thousand songs in your pocket. Yeah, yeah. You know, a campaign that yeah. followed the iPod back yeah. in the day. Um, and then the other one, um, uh, you know, reading the book Shoe Dog by Phil Knight um, okay. and, and Nike. I mean. We're actually a line with Adidas at the moment, but <laughs> they won't like that. But yeah, um, yeah. abort, abort. <laughs> yeah, but um, but yeah, I mean the the kind of story behind Nike. Very nice. Yeah. So before we go any further, do you have? Because I'm going to ask a few questions, right? That's the whole sure. point of the show. If I ask something that you're feeling a little bit uncomfortable, do you have a do you have a safe word? So if you say it, I'll just sort of hold back. Yeah, I think we're going to go with uh, VAR. VAR. Very, yeah, All right. Very, uh, you're going to do, you're going to do the uh, hold on a second. We put down. You're going to do the old classic. Yeah, yeah, we'll get the screen out. Yeah, yeah we'll go like to that. the screen. I like that. Okay, very <laughs> nice. So, uh, you happy in Dubai? Yep. Was, yeah. it, was it the right choice looking back, leaving uh, leaving the UK? 100%, yeah. Um, I think at that point in my career, I um, felt it was a kind of do or die moment in terms of putting this uh, plan and vision in place. Um, and we've not looked back. You know, the, we've had over 250 athletes now through the door from different sports and, yeah. and stuff that you know has been beyond my wildest dreams to yeah. be honest with you uh, consultancy roles in in sports that i'd never really had an intention to ever work in yeah. um and uh yeah i mean what's yeah. what's not to love right it, like, it, i'm yeah. an active guy i love my running i can get down kite beach on a saturday morning and yeah. bang out the kilometers so yeah, yeah it's very nice no I, I love meeting people that have they're doing what they love and, and it's written all over your face you enjoy your job you enjoy waking up every morning and just doing what you do. And I think there are so many people out there who aren't in that fortunate position to want to be able to live out what you wrote down when you were in high school. Yeah. So it's absolutely amazing that you're doing that. And it's, um, you know, I wish, I wish uh, you know, a lot of friends of mine, at least, they have these dreams, they have these aspirations, but uh, they've kind of sat on it and they haven't really done much about it. So yeah. I think what, what advice would you give to people who have always kind of had this passion, but they're not really doing anything about it? What would you say to them? Yeah, I think um, a couple of things really. I mean, fortune favors the brave, right? Um, is is a great saying. Yeah. Um, and then uh, the other one, we have, we've got it as a as a business mantra, and and you know we say passion, not pounds, right? So we do this because we're passionate about it. As a result of that, we're happy. We'll perform better. Yeah. Um, and then you know the, the the income, the margin, the custom, that'll all follow. Um, you know, as long as we're we're doing what we love and performing to a high standard. Yeah. Have you had any setbacks in your business or setting it up? Or have you had moments where like, what am I doing? Am I doing the right thing? Because people, again, when they want to launch their own business, they always have this sort of, yeah. you know, it sits on your shoulder, there's a little bit of fear saying, am I, is this going to work? Am I going to be successful? Can I actually live out my dream doing it? Do you I have think, those moments? Yeah, I think it's a constant um, remodel, right? Like what we are now as a business is not anything I ever dreamt of being. Um, you know, I came here and had no real idea in terms of the infrastructures of Dubai, the licenses that were required, the um, connections with, you know, we're based in Jumeirah Beach Hotel and yeah. have been for the last few years, so we didn't have those connections. So, 
um, you've got to embrace that journey and, and ultimately you've got to start somewhere, right? Yeah. Like there's never going to be a perfect time to start anything. Yeah. Um, I think like most things in life, your input equals output, yeah. basically. So yeah. what you put in, you, you, you're going to get the result um, afterwards. So mm -hmm. um, one thing I, I just had in terms of um, an, uh, my own internal kind of mantra was that, you know, I won't be beaten in this uh, kind of project due to a lack of effort. You know, yeah. I'll always be able to, at the end of it, look myself in the mirror and yeah. say, well, I gave it everything. It's not worked great. Yeah. Like, whatever. And you literally are the type of guy that work, does work hard and does play hard, right? You're, you're full in it. With everything that you're doing, it's 100%. There's yeah. no letting up. Yeah. Uh, yes. Although, to be honest, there's a bit of a remodel, uh, I think, that's, that's happened um, internally. I think probably about a year ago, maybe just over a year ago, I was um, probably experiencing a bit of burnout, to be honest. It had been a full throttle four years. Yeah. Um, and this is now something within my kind of pillars of performance uh, talk, which I'm, I'm now taking out there to show these kind of lessons. Yeah. Uh, there's a great quote from a guy who uh, is a British fellow who um, has climbed Everest more times than any other British man. Uh, how many, how many times? I think he's done about seven or eight times. Oh, wow. Yeah. And you know, it's not easy to summit Everest because weather conditions, it's expensive. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, you can you can try 10 times and not even make it up there once. So for him to do it seven, eight times, that's, that's Yeah, impressive. exactly. Yeah. And, um, but he sort of says... I've, uh, I've done base camp. I haven't done the summit. <laughs> <laughs> but he sort of says the, you know, what is high performance? And he says it's, um, you know, performing at 70 to 80% of your maximum. Yeah. Yeah. Um, on a consistent basis, but you've got another gear to go to when required. Mm. And that quote really resonated with me, yeah. actually, because he's sort of saying, if I'm at 100% every single day, yeah. I'm dead on exactly. the mountain. You know, it's, yeah. it's, 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 so just it's keep a little bit in that. reserve. Correct. When you need it, you tap into it and then off you go. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Very nice. um, and, and I would say that's the same when it comes to the elite sports people out there, you know. They, they, they do the same thing deep at the at the key moments they can dig deep yeah the winners so let's let's there. talk about that so who who impresses you most of all of the you know the celebrities the footballers you know other sports athletes who's impressed you most in terms of the mindset in terms of their physical uh, abilities yeah oh, very curious the one I, i've not worked with him um but the one that i've seen in the flesh in terms of his attitude to his training um and just aura around a particular event was rafa nadal like He's a monster, isn't he? When when he walks in the room, yeah. everyone sits to attention. Yeah. You know, yeah. when he's in the gym, it's full throttle. There's um, I don't know if you've watched the Netflix uh, show. The new um, it's a, yeah the about the stars points. behind yeah about the yeah. stars behind the scenes. I haven't watched it, yet, but I do. I would would like to watch. In that. the obviously, he's, he's the king of clay, right? French yeah. Open final last year. Yeah. He's uh, at the back end of his career. He spent a year out previously with a knee injury. Yeah. Um, and the finals against, I can't think whether it was maybe Casper Rudd, who's a, obviously a young up and coming player. Yeah. He beats him in the, in the tunnel yeah. before, before he's even set foot on the court, he's beat him it's all up in here. the tunnel because of his intensity and his application, mm. his warm up. Uh, you know, the other, the other players just stood there kind of yeah. looking a bit nervous. I mean, you would, it's Rafa Nadal, it's clay. Exactly. It's, it's the, you know, it, it's, it's the French open. You're going to be intimidated no matter what. The exactly. legacy is right there. So I can understand that. But yeah, he's, he's a phenomenal athlete, but I think his, his capability, his mindset matches his physical you know, capacity. It's, it's yeah. when you marry them both together, you know, you can do great things. Yeah. And then, I mean, the ones that we've had in the building uh, that have, kind of been directly, um, you know, in contact with um, Robert Lewandowski, who's obviously had yeah. a fantastic career. Yeah. Um, very fit, isn't he? Very, so very, lean. I mean, very, all these guys, fit. like, the, there's no, nothing's ever taken for chance, yeah. you know. Um, the other one that I think will be the best player in the world is Drew Bellingham. Yeah. He's, he's an, was when he came in 19 years old. Yes. Um, but the psychology that he's got and the maturity that he's got... I was going to say, very mature. Is, um, is a is another level yeah Fair enough. so i i um i have a a, a bag of balls <laughs> and in in the bag uh there are different topics now you don't know what's in the bag correct you've no never idea. seen it you've never no seen idea. this before so we're going to do a little bit of improv right they're going to be related to what we've been kind of discussing um and uh, let's just have a chat and see how it goes let's yeah go. sound good yeah do you want to pick the first one yeah all right in my uh my branded my branded bag right there See what you got there. Hopefully you pick a good one. 
experience or youth. Okay, so what do I mean by this? So if you're an athlete and you've been doing this for a few years, um, you build up a lot of experience. Okay, you understand how your body works, you know how you push it to your limits. And also if you're a football player, you know, you become better with age from a, from a mindset, from understanding the game, etc. But you might not have the physical capabilities as the youth would. Mm -hmm. So if you were going to sort of build a sort of the perfect team, would you go on the youthful side and get that sort of additional capacity physically? Or would you go with the experience side and uh, use a little bit more of the, of the experience that they have? Um, interesting. I mean, the real answer is both. a blend of both, yeah. yeah? Um, but if you wanted a kind of here and now winning team, yeah. I would go experience. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's where, obviously, in football, you've got a big sacking culture, right, of coaches, yeah. managers. Yeah. Um, because they're not, they don't have the time to kind of um, remodel and mistakes are going to, with young players, mistakes are always going to happen. Yeah. Um, and that's how they get the experience. You know, look at Mikel Arteta now, he's doing very, very, very well with yeah. that team. It's yeah. a youthful team, but it's yeah. been together for three years. I know you're a big Liverpool fan. Jurgen Klopp had the same. Same yeah, thing. Let's, talk, let's not talk about years, the season. Let's not talk about where, the season. <laughs> <laughs> look at where they got to, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, so I'm a big believer in process, yeah. um, but it depends on what the yeah. what the uh, physically. When do you stop? When when do you start? You know, where is your peak? Whether it's a footballer or a sports athlete, I know it depends on the sport to some degree. But generally speaking, is there a physical peak? Um, and then after that, it's kind of a little bit downhill. There's always a time frame on these guys. So, you know, it's very rare. You see people at 37, 38 um, that are at the top, top, top level. Yeah. Um, and those that are there comes down to what habits they've done from when they were 18. You know, yeah. someone like Jude, for example, I think yeah. will have a long career yeah. barring a serious injury because what he does every single day is yeah. um, is geared around him being the best possible athlete. Yeah. Um, other players that are out there, I don't know, let's look at your Gascoins, for example, yeah. from, from way back, you know, made bad decisions along yeah. the way, yeah. which affects your longevity. Um, so yeah. I'm a, actually a huge fan of James Milner. Yeah. Huge fan. Yeah. Um, he's I think a machine. He's, he's a machine, isn't he? Yeah, and every single club that he's been at, um, I think he will... You know, he will always be welcomed back to those clubs and given a standing ovation at every single club yeah. that he's been at. So I'll give you a different sport, boxing, okay? Yeah. So boxers tend to get better with age in the mm -hmm. sense of they understand when to pull punches, how to, you know, yeah. how to, you know, how to sort of manage the different rounds. Yeah. Does that play, again, so if you're thinking broader, beyond just football, youth first experience, across all sports, does that still apply? Would ex experience still win? I if, think so, yeah. yeah? I okay. think you look at Novak, you look at Rafa, you look at Roger. Yeah. Um, Lewis Hamilton's even yeah. now uh, in the F1 world, uh, boxing-wise. I feel um, so much better you're saying experience, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, for sure. I'm getting on in the years, so I'm, I'm so glad yeah. you said that. Very nice, yeah. very nice. But, but, but I think it comes down to psychology. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, the underpinning thing to all uh, this kind of performance and the pillars of performance yeah. is not physical, tactical, technical, strategic, whatever. You can't impact those other key corners unless you have the right psychology. Yeah, with you. Let's pick another ball, shall we? Good stuff. So we're going with experience. To nap or not to nap? Ah, uh, right. So I mentioned right at the beginning, we talked about how many hours sleep you get, right? Yeah. And I said we'll talk about it later. So here we are. Uh, how important is it to sleep and to take a nap throughout the day or at night? Because I know you're a big believer in, uh, in what sleep can do to enhance, you know, an athlete's performance. So yeah. talk to me a little bit about that. Not just athletes, anybody. Um, sleep is the number one recovery strategy um, for everything. There's direct correlations with sleep and anxiety levels, cognitive ability. You know, the difference of six to eight hours sleep will reduce your cognitive function by 40%. Oh, wow. Um, they actually, you know, there's a chap called Matthew Walker who's a leading sleep expert, and he's uh, cited studies where actually underslept drivers are more dangerous on the road than drunk drivers. Um, so sleep is paramount yeah. yeah it's pointless getting the massage or the ice bath if you yeah. had four hours so sleep. that's your sort like of you. that's your foundation <laughs> layer it all starts with a good sleep 100 okay yeah. what comes after sleep would you say after sleep nutrition okay and hydration yeah okay. and then you're into your massage your ice bath therapies yeah. etc um, all the other fads all the other all the other stuff fads are up at the top i actually yesterday on my instagram put a 
recovery pyramid infographic, which was really nice out there. Um, and yeah, it's uh, sleep and hydration, nutrition are the two most. So how? Research. So how often? Uh, what? How? Should you sleep if you're an athlete? Let's say, should you have a quick nap, power nap in the afternoon? Does that help in terms of you know recovery? If you're not an athlete, should you? sleep at a certain time, wake up at a certain time. Is there a science behind what is the optimal amount of sleep, whether you're an athlete or non-athlete? Um, eight hours is your kind of um, general figure, if sweet you will. Sweet spot. Sweet yeah, spot. the sweet spot, yeah. yeah. Uh, and the reason behind that is you need to get into REM sleep. So REM sleep is where all the magic happens. It's where protein synthesis and muscle Sorry, what is REM sleep? Sorry. Rapid eye movements. So okay. this is where dreams happen, right? So if okay. you're dreaming, then... You're in a good place. Okay. Yeah. Very nice. Um, so yeah, REM sleep is great. I mean, I've not got the I mentioned off camera. I've not got the the yeah, whoop yeah. on. I use the whoop to track yeah. mine, but it's yeah. fascinating. Yeah. Um, kind of. But the thing is, the you more you think that. about sleep, right? The more you think about I'm not getting enough sleep. You can't sleep, and you want to sleep, but you sometimes can't. It's like when yeah. you have a flight or you have to wake up early the next morning. Yeah. You have this countdown in your head. Well, I've got five hours. Goes four hours. Go. It just gets so. How do you? How? And I know you're not necessarily a sleep therapist, but how do you? you know, allow yourself to not overly worry about sleep because that can actually affect you. Yeah, um, I think having consistency in terms of the time you go to bed, your environment, you know, the we're all cavemen, right? Like yeah. from back in the day, so we're-, we're my, very, my wife would agree with you on that one. Yeah, so we're, we're, we're judged by the circadian rhythm. The sun goes up, the yeah. sun comes down, right? Yeah. Um, so our bedrooms, you know, are not designed for us to be on yeah. social media, on iPads, on- TV, you know, yeah. whatever it is, um, that's our that's our hub. It's where we, we go to sleep. So, you know, getting into the bedroom at a set time with no distractions will help. Um, for me, reading in bed increases my sleep, my REM sleep, sorry, by about 20%. Yeah, nice. Um, that's something I've found. The reason I, I like the Whoop as a wearable tech is because it's actually got a diary with it. Yeah. So then you can start to marry up the habits with good sleep, bad night's sleep, et cetera. And you yeah. kind of find what works yeah, for yeah, you. Yeah. Yeah. It's different for everyone. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Nice. Um, so my answer to the question probably is uh, nap if you've not had enough sleep. Yeah. So you today. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, I, got four, I got four hours, by the way, <laughs> yeah. last night. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, um, but generally, yeah. you know, try and have good sleep hygiene. Okay. Um, yeah, and Good. it's something even in my own life now. I, I see clients early doors in the morning, et cetera, and I'm I'm compromising my sleep for that. So yeah. does that make me a better practitioner, a better business owner? Probably not. Yeah. I'm trying to I'm trying to do the right thing yeah. by getting in early and yeah. working with clients, but I'm sacrificing the thing that yeah. actually optimizes me. I think for some people also it's sort of in syncing with your partner. So if your partner has different sleep patterns, that can also affect you. Yeah. Right. Sleeping earlier, sleeping late. Yeah. Are you are you seeing anyone at the moment? Are you uh just, just me and the dog. Are we, are we doing VAR? Is it, or is not yet? We're, we're querying VAR at that moment. Yeah. <laughs> right, we'll move. We'll move on. Let's pick. <laughs> let's pick out another ball. Do you want to? Do you want to give sure. me? Give, give me. Give me a go. Yeah. Let me see what I can. What I can find out. Thank you. Toughest sport. What is the toughest sport out there, and why? Interesting. Uh, I would go down the route of probably. Um, I'm gonna go a bit out there actually, please, and say like your heptathlon and that sort of uh, event yeah. for num number of reasons really. Um, if you look at like a Jess Ennis, for example, yeah, she's got to be up there at the very elite level in seven different disciplines. She's got to do it just with lottery funding, so she's not really, you know, um, paid the the big box, mm -hmm. so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, and you've got a, you've got a four year cycle to win Olympic gold. You've yeah. got one chance. If you don't get that chance, if you don't hit that spot, then you're waiting another four years. Yeah. You know, it's not like in football or no. whatever, where it's, you know, it's tournament after tournament, right? You've always got a chance to win something. Yes. Um, so I would say that, um, I mean, it's, it's tough enough to train for one sport. Yeah. Never mind to train seven different disciplines, seven different energy systems, muscle groups, whatever. Yeah. You know. Um, so yeah. I Interesting. You're absolutely right. I never really thought about it like that. I was thinking in a different league altogether. I was thinking one particular sport, but actually, you know, athletics in general, but has that sort of focus. But you know, 
someone like her has to do a bit of everything. It has to be fantastic at it. Yeah. Um, do you think there's a do you think there's a sport out there that shouldn't be called a sport? Um, you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. Like is dance a sport? Is snooker a sport? Yeah. I would say they are more of a game. Okay. Yeah. Um, but then, I mean, I'd be interested to know what the definition of sport is. The definition of sport to me is like physical exertion, right? Yeah. Like that yeah. sort of thing. But, yeah. yeah. Um, Hundred percent. There's you know high levels of skill in those yeah, yeah. Uh, sports games. On on, on um, yourself, just on what um, what do you do to keep fit? What's your what's your routine look like? A uh, lot of running, a lot of gym. Unfortunately, can't play football anymore uh, due to a knee injury. Six weeks before I moved to Dubai, actually. Okay. Um, so yeah, don't play football anymore. But um, yeah, we've got our Saturday morning run club, which is. Uh, basically just doesn't that hurt your knees it. though the impact of running no the here? running the running's fine actually yeah. the running's okay. fine and we are blessed here in Dubai obviously we've got some nice running tracks that are cushioned and yes. all that sort of stuff so it's not like I'm pounding the streets of yeah, yeah 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 nice <laughs> alright let me pick out another one do you like this by the way my little oh uh, yeah it's good yeah, you have no good idea what's coming next like it. yeah well, let's see what's coming out next alright right this one talks about mind over matter so how important is the psychology versus the actual physical I think it Physicality. Under, underpins the whole thing. Yeah, that's the. It's something that I had to reverse engineer for uh, the MeFit conference because one of my speeches was the pillars of performance. So I had to put this presentation together and figure what what actually makes them performers. Yeah, yeah. Um, and psychology is is everything. Yeah. You know, the habits that they uh, put in place, avoiding distractions, especially you know when the athletes come here to Dubai distractions everywhere for them right like you know mentioned about jude yeah what hotel do you stay in you know he's a 19 year old guy the easy option for him would be to go and stay at one of the more kind of party hotels etc yes. yeah. but he comes out he brings his mum. he stays in a low-key hotel because training's his focus and being the best player in the world can you tell him to come focus. to liverpool by the way can you, if you have a good relationship with him sell I think that probably was on the cards, but then uh, I'm not so <laughs> sure about this season anymore. <laughs> uh, VAR. <laughs> so, um, okay. So on terms of the the psychology of it, is there a sport that you think that's out there that more than anything else, if you don't have it mentally, you're never going to be able to be successful? Um, golf, definitely. Yeah. Again, new Netflix documentary. Great okay. watch. Yeah. Um, tennis is the same. I've seen that firsthand where... Um, the athlete I was actually with um, at the Australian Open last year beat herself in her head. Yeah. Like this is somebody who has been an elite level tennis player since the age of five. So yeah. they know how to hit a tennis ball, right? Yeah. Uh, and within that kind of game, it was um, Friday night, Friday night under the lights yeah. uh, at Rod Laver. So 20,000 in the stands, primetime TV slot, um, Olympic gold medalist at the time, favorite to yeah. win that match. Yeah. Um, and she was hitting the ball in the stands, yeah. you know. Yeah. So it's crazy, isn't it? Technique yeah. well, isn't the issue because yeah. it's been there for a long yeah. time. Yeah. Physicality wasn't the issue yeah. because actually the previous two rounds were pretty easy. So the you know we monitor training loads yeah. and all that sort of stuff. So loads were all good. It was performance anxiety. Yeah. It was. Um, so how, how can how can someone you know, overcome that? What tips? What advice would you give to someone who is really struggling with? You know, yeah, the mental side of the game. Um, there's a few great uh, books actually on there, and there's a chap called Professor Steve Peters who um, actually works with Chris Hoy, Stephen Gerrard. Um, actually, Jordan Henderson mentioned him in a recent podcast I listened to, um, and they've all attributed completely life-changing experiences by working with Steve. And he talks about the chimp paradox. Is, is the name of the book? Okay. Um, so basically, we've all got. Uh, two key areas in our brain. We've got the limbic system, which is also present in chimpanzees. It's been confirmed by MRI. Um, you know, that's responsible for drives. So that's mm -hmm. responsible for fight, flight response, mm -hmm. aggression. You know, road rage mm -hmm. is a chimp response, right? Because yep. it's uh, in that moment you think, I'm going to die here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, then you've got your um, frontal cortex, which is the human. So it's always. Every decision we make in life is a chimp v human uh, interaction, but the chimp is four times more powerful than really than the, oh. the frontal cortex and four to five times faster at making decisions. 
So the frontal cortex's job is never to argue with the chimp because it's always going to lose, yeah? But it's there to kind of like reason, draw on some past experience, all those sort of things. So, you know, going back to the experience over youth, yeah. you need that experience. You need to have made the mistakes to, to get the, the right outcome so you don't select the same decisions. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, that, that kind of concept is great. And, the, you know, the, the most successful team in any sport is the All Blacks. And there's a great book called Legacy uh, by James Kerr. And within that book, it talks that the All Blacks work on blue head and red head. So redhead is results focused, um, you know, can't really handle um, pressurized situations, etc. Bluehead is process focused. Yeah. So it doesn't matter what happens externally to that. We just focus on the process. Mm. So from their side of things, within their training, they'll play like uh, 15 versus 13. Yeah. And the coach will give everything to the other team. So there are two men down and then they're getting no decisions. All the decisions are going What is them. happening within the group and he's looking to observe, you know, do you stick to process or do you focus on result? Do you keep playing the kind of New Zealand way or do you completely, I don't know, it's the old like yeah. punt it long in football kind yeah. of thing, right? Yeah. Or are you just going to keep passing yeah, yeah. Uh, Guardiola style, yeah. you know? But they also have, I mean, they also use psychology, the All Blacks, you mentioned it, before the game, right? Yeah. I mean, very famously, they... They intimidate the the opponents. Correct. And yeah. uh, a little bit like um, Casper Ruud against Nadal. Yeah. You know, sometimes the game's already won. Yeah. The, the hacker, right? They call it the hacker. Yeah, the hacker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, very good. Right, should we pick our final ball? Right, do you want to go for it? Yeah. Do, do the honours. Nature or nurture? Right. Are you born with unbelievable ability or can it be nurtured? Very interesting question we were discussing yesterday, actually. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, great, great balls. Yeah, <laughs> great balls. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think human performance can be nurtured because I think there's so many different facets uh, under the surface that uh, can be in increased, you know, like psychology we've spoken a lot about there. Um, physicality can be affected. However, um, going back to the golf, the golf uh, documentary is what stimulated this discussion, yeah. right? Um, there's videos of Rory McIlroy at five years old. Yeah. And the things he is doing, he was world champion at five years old, all the way through, you know, 16, he's on the tour, etc. When you look at uh, Nadal, Andy Murray, you know, um, Lewis Hamilton, what he was doing in go-karting, the great, great people, I think, have just got it, yeah. like, personal opinion yeah i think you know by the age of 10 yeah. who's got it i mentioned phil jones earlier on the uh, on the talk and um we knew we knew phil had played for england at yeah. 10 years old yeah he was so so much better than anyone else yeah um i was fortunate enough to briefly work with jack Grealish when he was 16 um it took him till he was 25 to um play for england yeah. but he was the best player in england by a mile so the, 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 I'm going to ask a question again. It's, it's, it's very subjective, but the argument has always been made about who's the greatest football player. Yeah. And recently it's become about the two goats, Ronaldo and Messi. Yeah. A lot of people have said Messi is natural talent. A lot of people said Ronaldo's had to work very hard yeah. and uh, very focused and committed. He's nurtured his talent along the way. Yeah. Who would you pick? Messi, every day of the week. Okay. All right. Yeah. No, 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 that's no. it. <laughs> so, look, going back to a little bit about you, let's talk a little bit about you. Um, why do you do what you do, Chris? I think um, ultimately I'm passionate about people maximizing their potential, whatever that is. And where does that come from? Um, why do you care about getting other people? I, th I think, I think it's, it's, probably, it's probably because I, I mentioned I'm a failed footballer, in inverted commas. Um, I think most people who are in my industry are not failures, but you know they, they didn't succeed in whatever that sport is, whether it's a tennis coach or whatever it is, golf coach. Um, and there's probably things now that I know that I wish I did when I was 15, 16, 17 years old. Because I think if I'd have done those, not guaranteed, but there'd have been a much higher uh, chance of being probably a professional footballer. So what would you tell yourself if you can go back in time? What yeah. would you tell your 15-year-old self? 
get in the gym every day. You know, put the put the hard runs in, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm-hmm. I went down more an academia route. You know, for me, um, if I compare to kind of the guys I know who are professional players, um, it was football training for me was very much like you need to do your homework, otherwise training's cancelled. Yeah, yeah. Um, whereas for them, it was you need to do your runs and all your other stuff, and then we'll come on to your homework at eight at night time, right? Yeah. So there's no um, obviously right or wrong answer, um, certainly from a parenting point of view. Uh, and, and you do need to bear in mind that like, you know, the dropout rate of football in particular is 99%. So yeah. um, it's very cutthroat. Oh, it's incredibly cutthroat, you know. Um, and even at 18 years old, you know, the, the reality of the situation is you've got an under 18s team, there's 25 in that team, only two of them will ever, ever be professional players. Yeah. Do you work with do you work with younger people to help? Again, you may not be able to do it for yourself, but take all the life lessons that you have yeah. to help try and get the next generation, the people that could potentially make it, to get them in the right mindset and right mind frame to be able to go out and be successful. Yeah, it's a huge um, pillar of what our business is now, actually, which wasn't the plan five years ago. But um, so we've just uh, set up Elite Football Performance, which is a three hundred and sixty holistic. Uh, approach to football we're doing the same with the tennis space the running space um, an educational arm of our business which will be you know things that we're discussing here Um, and it's all geared around that and the the beauty of what we've got as a company is we've got these guys who have done it um, you know at a professional level but they are training with local you know in the same building as an under 15s player from an academy in Dubai. Must be so you know? inspiring for them to see these, you know. Yeah, exactly. Lewandowski just walks in and it's like, wow. Yeah, exactly that. Exactly that. And and um on a podcast I did uh, not so long back, um, I spoke about when Johnny Sexton was in the building. So you've got Johnny who's thirty seven, he's in his final six nations now, um, and will be leading Ireland as the number one team in the world uh into the next World Cup. Uh, so and ex effectively Ballon d'Or winner of rugby, yeah. Um, and I had a twenty year old player, Joe Geldhart from Leeds, who has got a lot of potential in the same building, having a chat. And I said to Joe, I said, the best thing you can do, mate, in this next two days, is just speak to Johnny, yeah, about what it takes to stay at the level. And that makes you going back to you, that gives you a sense of pride when you're when you're being able to see these these youngsters sort of come along, give them that kind of level of exposure given that sort of coaching, that guiding, even a little bit of parenting to some degree. Yeah, fulfillment, I think. Yeah, ra- rather than pride, like fulfillment. You know, yeah. are, are we ticking the box? One of our business uh, pillars is is impact. What impact can we make? Yeah. Um, and and that, that ticks the box. So you, you must care a lot about people, right? I mean, to do what you do, to try and help people. Oh, it's, it's business. You still have to make money from doing it. But, yeah. you know, to get into physiotherapy from the get-go means that you generally... Care we want to help, yeah. yeah, yeah. You want to help. So, w- where do you think that comes from, Chris? Again, I'm trying to dig a little bit deeper. Why? Yeah. Why do you want to help people so much? Why does it matter to you? Um, probably a couple of things. I think it was just something that was always um, taught throughout my childhood from parents, grandparents, etc. You know, like you know, look after others or whatever. Um, there's Christian background, grandparents, very, yeah. very um, devout Catholics. Yes. Um, and then uh, on top of that as well, um, actually prior to moving to Dubai, I've, I've been directly experienced to four suicides, so two uncles, two best friends wow. who've ki- killed themselves. Um, so that mental health space is something I'm incredibly passionate about, um, which is why now I'm a bit more focused into the psychology element, really. Yeah. Um, off a camera, we spoke about, you know, people versus athlete, you know, yeah. got you got to look at person first before athlete, these guys have got incredible amounts of pressure to perform, but yeah. what's the underpinning uh, element to performance? And for me, that's happiness, yeah. um, you know, and, and having the right environment around them. So, yeah. yeah um, well, thank you for sharing that. I know it's obviously, it's, it's very sensitive, but thank you for sharing that. On on the, but that must have been quite traumatic, obviously going through, you know, when you were a bit younger, yeah. seeing this around you. How, how, how what, what was your coping mechanism? Uh, Good and bad coping mechanisms, to be honest. I've spoken openly about this because yeah. obviously the um, the message out there is that you know men, they're all, they're all men, uh, should speak, and, yeah. and I do firmly believe that. Um, 
I would say. So when I, when I was 15, I lost two uncles in the space of three weeks. So I was very um, shielded from that, to be honest with you, um, reflectively. Um, you know, my mum was uh, was protective of me at that time. Yeah. Um, one of the uncles that, that passed away, he uh, you know used to be around two or three times a week. Uh, he was 28 at the time, so we'd be having dinner together and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and then um, fast forward, what was it, about 10 years later, um, my old gym buddy who uh, actually got me into the gym, we used to play football together, um, took his life. That was a big shock. And I think actually at that point, a lot of previous trauma exposed itself that I hadn't actually dealt with. Yeah. So I didn't handle that very well at all. I didn't speak to anyone. Um, I had um, issues professionally at the time because it was unstable environment. I was working at Bolton Wanderers. Uh, club was in liquidation pretty much and we weren't getting paid and all sorts of things. So at that point, um, didn't handle that particularly well. Um, and then fast forward a year after and um, my old housemate, who was pretty much my brother, to be honest, like we, we you know, send... 15, 20 voice notes to each other a day and um, whatever. Um, and and he took his life. And um, wow. rather than that kind of spiral me down, that inspired me to move forward because I'd had the previous experience um, of handling it badly to now I thought to myself, I'm not going to let this go in the same direction. Like ultimately um, I've got to learn the lessons here. Uh, brought myself, my mom, me and my mom and me have been very, very close uh, throughout our, our entire life. But I remember just, you know, daily basis having phone calls with my mom. Um, actually went into the goal setting kind of uh, space. Took up running uh, as a, as a, I guess, form of meditation. Yeah. Um, so within that year, I wanted to run a marathon. Um, just, just used it as a trigger to yeah. accelerate life, really, yeah. and. You know, going back to one of your earlier questions about people who sit there and think, oh, I want to do this or I want to do that. You know, it took it took that traumatic event really for me to, um, you know, put myself into gear and think, right, I actually want to do this and I want to have that experience. I'm young enough. I've got no ties. I don't want to be a 40-year-old man with regrets was a saying that I said to my mom. Um, and it, it always takes us to have those traumatic moments or key moments yeah. to make decisions uh, and going back to pete's work um on the future self thing he, he sort of says why why does it say that because deep down we all know what we want you know we all know who we are we know what we want to be in the future but or if you don't then figure out what that is uh, and start it with identity put the habits in place um and he says actually that you know we we let feelings drive our actions which is completely wrong because then your actions uh, dictate your identity. So if you're feeling a bit sad and low or whatever, and you start, I don't know, drinking or you know doing, doing other things, then that affects your identity, right? Yeah. Whereas if you have a, a firm identity of who you are and what you want to be and what you want to do, you'll put the actions in place. And then at the end of it, you enjoy the feelings. Yeah. So who are you? Who am I? Uh, I'm a passionate sports person, which fits, you know, what, what I do. Um, and I'm somebody that um, I believe is a leader, actually. Yeah. So, you know, how, and, and that can be whether that's by example, whether that's making tough decisions in the right moments. Um, yeah, that's what I would say. Chris, very inspiring. I think the, the word that was coming to my mind was you were telling and really thank you for sharing it was was resilience so you've just you've been through some stuff whether it's from your own personal injury perspective or losing friends or losing family members just putting yourself forward moving on getting on with it and and sort of channeling everything into a certain way and then going after your goals and it's it's very very inspiring um it has been a real pleasure uh yep. having you on this show i think we'll end it on that because it's a really powerful insight on how you've overcome certain things and i really want to thank you for being uh, for being part of this and um Hopefully we'll see you guys. We'll see you soon. Yeah. All right. Thanks for having me. Great. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thanks.